Welcome to George Mason, to the, to the Shar School building, and to our conference, The Abuse and Exploitation of Red Notices, Interpol, and the US Judicial Process by Russia and other authoritarian states. Spotlight on a critical threat that is brought to you by TRAC, the Terrorism Transnational Crime and Corruption Center with the support of the National Security Institute of the Antonin Scalia Law School. This week has been a very, I'd say, timely week for this conference because as all of you who are not totally consumed with Thanksgiving may have noticed that last week there was the election for the head of the presidency of Interpol. And as two of our panelists for this event, the Sunday before Thanksgiving wrote me and said, is this possible that, is, that a Russian is going to take over as the president of Interpol? And I think that there was a lot of sudden sort of media attention, political pressure, and this anticipated election of the president of Interpol um, did not happen as, as anticipated. But I think that this amount of media attention brought to the fore the problem of red notices because many, many publications talked about the problem and the abuse of red notices, which we'll talk about a little bit more as uh, Tom Firestone sets the stage. But this is what I would call a very timely conference on an issue that has deserved much more attention, which is the problem that we're not just dealing in this country with, with fake news, we're dealing with problems of abuse of the legal process that we're not prepared to deal with. And we are going to have eloquent discussions today from people who have worked on the problem of abuse of red notices, people who have been victims of abuse of red notices, and the problems of judicial interference. I want to thank all of our speakers who have donated their time to come and share with us. And we have had a very large registration, so I imagine there'll be many more people with us throughout the day, but already at this hour in the morning, there are many of you. Um, I will talk a little bit later about how I came to be aware of this issue and problems of abuse in a case that I was an expert witness in and how red notices are being abused in the United States and why we need to pay much more attention to um, how we handle this system of red notices that comes through Interpol and why it is a threat to our um, national security because the, of the importance of our judicial process and the rule of law in our society as a central pillar of our democracy. Um, I'm not going to talk more now. I've seen many of our distinguished speakers. There are other wonderful people that we could have had speak with us today who are on travel, but I'll say that people have been incredibly generous and willing to, to participate, and I look forward to a wonderful day discussing these issues that I believe are, are very, very important and, and need much more attention in, in our country. Um, I'm gonna turn the floor over now to a, a short welcoming remarks by um, Dean Mark Rizal of the Shar School, who I believe is right here and ready to come up. Thank you. Well, thank you, Louise. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Mark Rosell. I serve as the Dean of the Shar School of Policy and Government. The Shar School hosts uh, the uh, Transnational Crime and Corruption Center here at George Mason University, as well as a number of other centers and institutes, uh, such as the Hayden Center on Security and Intelligence, our Center for Regional Analysis, the Stephen Fuller Institute on the Washington Regional Economy, and a number of others. 
Uh, we are one of 10 schools and colleges at George Mason University, about 2,000 students split between here and Fairfax. Uh, we have programs all the way from undergraduate through uh, PhD with PhD programs in political science, public policy, and biodefense. Uh, we're delighted to collaborate today with the National Security Institute at the Scalia Law School. Um, we have worked on some projects in the past together. It's turning out to be uh, a very productive collaboration for uh, the Shar School here at George Mason University. And I too would like to thank uh, the speakers for contributing your time and expertise uh, to this event today. Uh, I'm also grateful that you all came this early in the morning uh, for this event, and Louise tell me, tells me that many more are, are going to be coming in throughout the day. Uh, I do want to congratulate Track and Louise for all of the contributions that uh, they are making to policy debates on a national and even on a global scale, as evidenced by the very substantial media coverage of its work. Um, particularly most recently, as Louise was just talking about the election of a new president of Interpol and the unexpected defeat of the Russian candidate due to the abuse of red notices. So uh, we at the Shar School uh, care very deeply about projecting externally uh, what we know here as scholars, what we learn uh, based on our research. Um, we care very deeply about of course, the scholarly community and the contributions we make to the academic literature. But I think you'll know, based on a lot of the work that's done by a number of scholars here, that uh, we're, we're pretty good at projecting the value of our research uh, to the outside world and, and its relevance to a number of policy debates locally, nationally, and internationally. And TRAC has really been at the forefront of um, you know, promoting policy research and analysis that has a real impact on the policy world. So, uh, Louise, I thank you for all of your work and for what TRAC is doing at the Shar School. I thank everyone for your participation today. Uh, I have to go address a group of Chinese uh, in a couple minutes uh, who are here from Shandong Province uh, Metropolitan Government to learn about American governmental practices. So uh, I'm going to pop in later today. I'm not going to be able to stay uh, for this morning's session. So again, welcome to the Shar School and George Mason University, and thank you for your attendance. And I'd like to introduce Matthew Hyman, who will represent the National Security Institute of the Scalia Law School. Thank you, Louise. Uh, good morning. My name is Matthew Hyman. Uh, I'm a senior fellow at the National Security Institute at the Antonin Scalia uh, law School. I'm also the Associate Director of Global Security there. And on behalf of the National Security Institute, uh, I just want to thank and welcome you, the audience, for attending, both here in the room and via the live stream. I also want to thank our distinguished speakers and panelists. For those of you that are not familiar with the National Security Institute, uh, as I noted, we are housed within the Scalia Law School. Uh, we are made up of uh, experts and academics that are focused on national security topics. Uh, and that covers the waterfront. So everything from intelligence to law of war uh, to uh, homeland security to cyber and emerging technology. Our experts and academics write about these topics, they speak about these topics, and they teach about these topics. Uh, and the National Security Institute is also responsible for uh, guiding the national security curriculum at the law school. Uh, we, in addition, uh, we are really focused on coming up with practical solutions to real world problems. That is the, uh, that is the motivating uh, uh, energy behind what the National Security Institute does. Given our mission, we're delighted to support today's event. Uh, and we are happy to be working with the Terrorism, Transnational Crime and Corruption Center at the Shar School. We look forward to continued collaboration and uh, we look forward to today's, to today's discussion. Thanks, Louise. Thank you. So our next speaker, or speakers, I should say, there's a um, mistake, is Tom Firestone, who is um, from Baker and McKenzie, who worked for many, many years as the representative of the Department of Justice in Moscow, who's going to talk about setting the stage, and also Bob Dietz from uh, from the Shar School, who's going to be talking um, 
a, a little, um, aren't, aren't you now or not? Oh, okay, um, on, on why this is a national security challenge. So please come, up, come on up. Um, you need to get a mic here from, from there. Good morning. First of all, I just want to thank Louise for putting on this conference. I think it's long overdue, and it's an extremely important topic. And as far as I'm aware, <clears throat> It's actually the first major conference dedicated to the subject of Interpol. And, um, you know, Louise is somebody who's always ahead of the curve on these things. I remember when I was in graduate school doing what was then called Soviet studies, a field which doesn't exist anymore. I got interested in the question of Soviet, organized crime in the Soviet Union, illegal, um, illegal trafficking and organized crime in the Soviet Union. I remember talking to my professor, and she was like, yeah, there's not really a topic, but there's this one woman in Washington, Louise Shelley, who writes on this stuff, so you should, uh, you should talk to her. And she was way ahead of the curve on that, and I think uh, what we see today, the fact that Louise is putting on this conference on Interpol, shows that she continues to be ahead of the curve on this issue. So thank you, Louise, um, and thank everyone for, for coming. <clears throat> I thought well, Louise asked me to set the stage, and so I thought what I would do is try to do that. Just a little bit of background. I assume everyone here knows what Interpol is and um, how it operates, but I'll just say a couple words to make sure that we're all um, uh, working off the same page. Interpol is an international criminal, uh, international criminal police organization. It's been around for about a century. It's headquartered in Lyon, France. It does not arrest people. People always think, you know, in the movies they show like Interpol going out and like grabbing somebody and arresting them and you know solving murders. They don't don't do that. The main function of Interpol is to disseminate information among member countries. Almost every country in the world is a member of Interpol, and they participate in Interpol through things called NCBs, National Central Bureaus, which are um, through which they are represented by local law enforcement, national law enforcement officers who participate in Interpol events. Um, uh, Interpol is involved in training, collection of information, analysis, but the main function of Interpol is dissemination of information among law enforcement agencies from member countries. Um, the main way in which Interpol disseminates information is through a system of notices. Notices are notices that go out to various member countries um, seeking information or seeking some sort of action. So I think they're like black notices, which are about like unidentified bodies, and blue notices, I think, are uh, seeking information on somebody's location or whereabouts. The main problem that we're concerned with here today is so-called red notices. Red notices seek the arrest of an individual for purposes of their extradition and criminal prosecution in the requesting country. Um, red notices are often public. If you go to the Interpol site, you can see who is a subject of a red notice. It has a picture of the person, it has their basic identifiers, and a short description of the crime for which they are wanted in the country that has um, and just put out the red notice on them. The problem with all of this, I mean, it all sounds good, and it is, for the most part, good. Um, international law enforcement cooperation is a good thing, because otherwise drug dealers, criminals, murderers could escape justice by uh, traversing borders, and it's important that law enforcement around the world cooperate to identify and um, uh, prosecute transnational criminal organizations. So the purposes are good. Unfortunately, like a lot of good things, it is subject to abuse by a few bad actors. And the problem that we're of with Interpol with red notices is that it is extremely easy to get a red notice on someone. It is extremely difficult to get off of the Interpol list once you have been put there as the subject of a red notice. And while you are the subject of a red notice, before you're even arrested or any action is taken against you, it can really, really screw up your life. Um, if you are, have a red notice out against you, first of all, you don't know if you're going to be arrested if you travel internationally. So it essentially cuts off international travel for you. It also it brands you to the entire world as a criminal. And it also, the consequence of that, obviously, is it makes it very hard to do business. It makes it hard to get a loan. It makes it hard to get a job. It really sabotages someone's life. 
And that's fine if the subject is a real criminal who has been proven to be such through, uh, through normal judicial procedures. However, if somebody is targeted as a subject of a red notice for political reasons or for economic reasons because somebody wants to sabotage their business, somebody wants to drive them out of politics, somebody wants to punish them for a political statement they've made, that is a real um, that is a real problem. It gives governments um, that are not subject to the rule of law an extra mechanism to harass their opponents. And that is the problem that we're really talking about today. This, has, this issue has come to the fore recently for a number of reasons. Um, and we've seen a number of high profile cases related to abuse of Interpol, and that's why we're gathered here today. Now, one question I thought it'd be useful to uh, address is why now? Interpol's been around for almost a century. The basic structure and procedures have not changed in all this time, why are we seeing such a problem now with Interpol? Um, and I think that here, I have not studied this, but you know, just from my own experience working on these kinds of issues, I think it's really three factors that have come together over the last 15 years that have got us in this situation. One, I think, is 9-11, the effects of 9-11. After 9-11, the whole world was focused on you know, connecting the dots, promoting international law enforcement cooperation. Why did we miss these guys? Law enforcement here wasn't talking to law enforcement there. We need to prevent the next big terrorist attack. And there was a real push to facilitate, expedite international um, in, uh, police cooperation. And nobody was really caring, nobody was really worrying about potential abuses uh, at that time. They were focused on catching terrorists and preventing the next <clears throat> major terrorist attacks. So I think that we developed a system where everything was focused on facilitating cooperation with probably insufficient attention to the potential negative effects of this and uh, potential abuse. So I think that's one thing that's driving, um, that has gotten us where we are today. Secondly, um, I think it's the collapse of the Soviet Union. I think that's important for a couple of reasons. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, on the one hand, we saw really the rise of um, the acceleration of transnational organized crime. Human trafficking um, was aggravated after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Money laundering, all of this sort of criminal element that arose in the wake of the um, uh, collapse of the regimes there. Um, facilitated, as I say, the uh, development of transnational organized crime. And again, like 9-11, focused attention on the importance of international law enforcement cooperation. And I think that meant a lot more uh, interaction among these agencies, a lot more focus on the possibilities of Interpol. And I'll talk about in a second the um, development of technology, new technology to facilitate information sharing. I think the collapse of the uh, Soviet Union is important for a second reason, which is with the collapse of the Soviet Union, we really see the rise of a um, new and particularly pernicious form of organized crime, which in Russian is called raiderstva. In English, we call it corporate raiding or just raiding. And what raiding is all about, and Louise and her center has done some great research and uh, um, uh, publications on this subject. To me, what distinguishes that from ordinary organized crime is that it relies on the affirmative use of the legal system to steal people's money and property. Ordinary organized crime, you know, some thug goes into a store and black jacket, you know, with a baseball bat, half of your profits are going to be mine from now on. It's a terrible problem. It's been around forever. But from a prosecutorial perspective, it's relatively easy to handle because there's no ambiguity there. It's a clear-cut crime, and it's uh, easily, uh, easily provable. Raiding, I think, is particularly dangerous because what it relies on is the use of judicial orders and the um, uh, veneer of legitimacy from the legal system in order to steal people's property. So in raids in Russia, you know, the thugs just don't go into somebody's business and take it over. They go into somebody's business armed with a judicial order, which has been corruptly obtained, giving them a right to seize the assets of the target business on the grounds of you know, alleged non-payment of a debt. Usually there's a lawsuit that starts this thing, that starts the whole thing off. You go to court, you get an order al allowing you to um, seize, the, uh, seize the property of the target company. And then you go in usually with some sort of combination of you know, privately hired thugs, judicial bailiffs, to seize, the, uh, to seize the target property. And as I say, this is much more dangerous than organized crime because there's ambiguity as to whether or not the 
what they're doing is a crime or just enforcing a legitimate order. And to prosecute a case like that, you've got to show not just the violent seizure of the business, but that the violent seizure was done for illegitimate criminal reasons, which is difficult to do when the thugs stealing the property have a judicial order in their hands. And you've got to prove that that judicial order was obtained illegally in order to prosecute them. This makes it much more difficult. So basically, you know, a thug with a gun is dangerous. A thug with a gun and a judicial order is much, much more dangerous because they're operating beyond the, behind the veneer of um, legal legitimacy. To me, abuse of Interpol, abuse of the red notice system is in many ways a international outgrowth, the foreign, the export of exactly that kind of technology that has been developed to steal people's businesses. It is taking it one step further. You harass somebody, you take their business, you drive them out of the country, they think they're safe. They're not safe because you can do domestically, you can do internationally what you've done domestically through Interpol. You get a red notice against them in a lot of corrupt countries. A um, criminal charges are easily obtained. You use those criminal charges to get a red notice against the person and then they're not safe anywhere in the world and you can continue to harass them and continue to pressure them whatever few assets they've left in the country that they were forced to flee from. You can now collect by using the red notice as, um, as leverage against them. So I think that's, um, the development of these techniques, which largely coincides with the post-Soviet era and the development of um, raiding in, uh, in the former Soviet Union, is another reason why we're seeing, um, seeing the rise in this practice uh, today. And then third, I think there's just simple technological developments. I know we've got someone here from Fair Trials, which, by the way, has done by far and away, far and away the best work on Interpol. And anyone who wants to know about Interpol, I strongly recommend you to read the two Fair Trials reports from 2013 and 2018 about Interpol. That is really the uh, those really the definitive statements on um, Interpol and the issues uh, related to it. But they will um, hope our colleague from Fair Trials will talk about the development of the iLink system, which just basically just makes it much easier for national uh, central bureaus to disseminate information through the Interpol network. Um, basically, they can. It's, not much more complicated than sending an email to law enforcement all over the world. Through this, you can uh, really evade the red notice system, which does involve some preliminary review at the level of Interpol before the red notice is disseminated. You can send a diffusion through this iLink system, which gets information about the subject whom you want arrested out to the entire world with very minimal review, if any, at Interpol. Um, and so I think the rise in uh, you know the uh, develop the technological developments make it easier to uh, disseminate. Uh, uh, red notices and diffusions, which we collectively refer to as alerts, has also facilitated this. And as a result of this, we've seen a rise in the issuance of um, red notice. I think in, if you look at 2001, 2002, the statistics, there may be 2,000 issued uh, a year at that time. In 2016, I think there are about 14,000 or 15,000 red notices issued. And according to fair trials, there are about 50,000 red notices circulating in the world today, much, much more than we had 20 years ago. So I think for all of these reasons, this has become a very important topic. And um, one that requires addressing. Before I wrap up, I just wanted to throw out some ideas that I hope our panelists will discuss during the day as to things that might be done in order to um, improve, the, uh, improve the Interpol system and uh, reduce the opportunities for abuse. And again, the um, Fair Trials reports, I think, are terrific on this. They have a number of great um, uh, recommendations which are in various stages of implementation by Interpol. And I would say, despite these problems, I think the situation has gotten a lot better over the last five years. There are more experts working there now. The staff has improved. There's more scrutiny of red notices. There's more sensitivity to the pot uh, potential for abuse. And I think a lot of that is the result of work, uh, excellent work by organizations like Fair Trials, and also the result of the fact that some of the people who have been victimized by Interpol are people of tremendous means who have really you know, put a lot of effort into using using their connections and resources to bring this attention, bring this issue to world attention. So just before I, um, before I wrap up, um, a few things that I hope we'll be able to discuss during the day in terms of ways of um, curbing potential abuse. I think that one way to address this might be on the front end, make it much harder to get a red notice out against someone. I think there are a lot of things that Interpol could do to do this. I think you could just set a higher standard of proof, a higher burden of proof to get access to the um, Interpol system. You could require a uh, formal probable cause finding from a local court, which right now is not required. You don't actually have to submit an arrest warrant to Interpol to get a red notice on someone. You don't have to have a domestic judicial officer sign 
sign off on it. You represent that you have that, but it's not actually a uh, proof requirement. You could also do things like require a personal certification from a domestic minister of justice or the domestic attorney general saying that they have reviewed the facts of this case and that the, is, uh, the charges are legitimate, grounded in evidence, not brought for an improper um, political purpose. Um, the Interpol may also want to consider limiting the class of crimes for which red notices are available. Um, as I say, the real goal of this is to stop terrorism, violent criminals, drug traffickers. You could limit it to those offenses, terrorism, drug trafficking, violent murder, violent sex offense, and eliminate financial crimes, white collar crimes, and that would take out all of the raiding cases that we see coming out of Russia and a lot of other countries of Eastern Europe because they are really directed for um, economic reasons. Um, another thing might be to prohibit the use of a red notice when somebody's location is known. I know cases where the individual is living openly uh, in a foreign country, and the question is, why do we need an Interpol red notice? Just send an extradition request. The Interpol red notice, in that case, can serve only to harass the individual and make it difficult for them to travel. If the, law, if the requesting state's interest is just in extraditing the person to prosecute them, you can do that through an extradition request, um, provided there is an extradition um, treaty between the two countries. So those are some ideas for things to do on the front end. On the um, back end, what, um, there might be things to do to make it easier for people to apply to have their data deleted and to, get, to have the red notice um, canceled. You could um, put in place a, uh, a rule that um, would say, which doesn't exist now, that if somebody has been the subject of an extradition request and the national court has denied the request for extradition on the grounds that the case is politically motivated, that would be binding on Interpol. They couldn't honor, they would have to uh, delete the red notice given a finding by the requested state, a judicial finding by the requested state that the um, request is, uh, is uh, politically motivated. It might also be possible to create a system whereby um, subjects of red notices could go to the national courts or maybe even the Ministry of Justice, some local agency, to get a declaratory judgment, to get some sort of review of their case that they could then take to Interpol saying my local, you know, my national government in the country where I'm residing or national court has reviewed this and found it to be politically motivated. Because again, the problem right now is there's no real judicial review of this at all. You have a system where people's rights are being severely um, uh, limited with no due process, no judicial review. So one of the things that you could do is create a system of judicial review in the country in which the person is residing, which would then be the finding, which, uh, which would then create a finding, which would then be binding on Interpol. Um, finally, I think there's just, uh, as the Fair Trials Report notes, there's just a resource problem. We have 50,000 red notices out there. Each one of them, to analyze any one of them, takes an enormous amount of time because you've got to get into the facts and the background and do research. And the Interpol, um, the Commission for the Control of Interpol's Files, and the uh, task force which Interpol has now set up to review red notices is still not adequately staffed to do this. Not surprising given the amount of work that would be entailed in doing this. I think it would be great to, um, if law firms throughout the world, and I think uh, if Interpol were interested, I would certainly try to persuade my law firm to contribute to this, could contribute to this uh, on a pro bono basis. You could have law firms um, assigning young lawyers, it would be great training for them, to review red notices at the request of Interpol, see if they are well documented, if they, the requesting state has uh, made its case persuasively, or if the case appears to be um, politically motivated. You could also help them create a database of practice to create transparency on prior decisions so you'd have something of a system of precedent in Interpol, which doesn't really exist now. Finally, it may be possible for law firms to contribute to this by providing pro bono representation to individuals who are the subject of red notices. A lot of people don't know how to get off the uh, list, don't know how to apply. Doing an application is extremely time, uh, time consuming and complicated. And I think something like that, law firms representing them, would all of this would contribute to transparency, review, thoroughness in the analysis of, uh, of red notices and would hopefully reduce the, uh, uh, alleviate the problem that we're seeing now. So anyway, those are just some of the topics that I hope we'll be able to discuss during the day. We have a lot of great experts speaking today. And that was, um, that wraps it up. And now I want to ask Mr. Dietz, please, if you want to come in and set the stage. Thank you.
Thank you very much uh, for that great introduction. It works very well with the comments I've prepared. I have to say I, I like uh, the proposals. Um, as a lawyer, it's hard not to like something that promises a lot of new billable hours. Uh, so I, you know, it's, I, said, I said pro bono. Uh, I, I'm not, yes, but I, I, I changed it a bit in my mind. I like, I like your amendment better, actually. <laughs> uh, I want to step back just a little bit, and I, I hope not to bore you. Um, but I think it's useful to put, to put the Interpol and its, the development of Interpol in, into a larger context. Uh, the development of law, uh, in my view, is the development of due process of law. Um, it's no accident that our Bill of Rights, uh, the bulk of the Bill of Rights, concern, concerns process and procedure, not substance. Uh, in the words of Felix Frankfurter, due process of law is a part of the great silences of the Constitution. From the beginning of legal development, thinkers have understood that for a judgment to be legitimate, a court must obtain personal jurisdiction over the defendant, whether in a criminal context or, or a civil context. So how does one obtain jurisdiction over somebody? That's not such an easy nut to crack. And, you know, if the defendant is part of a community, uh, then the issue is relatively straightforward. Uh, within that community, one serves the person with relevant papers. Um, and back in the day of kind of local commerce, that probably took care of 80%, 90% of legal problems. But what if the defendant, uh, the person that you're trying to sue is in, uh, is in Delaware and you're in Washington State and you know, there was some transactional relationship but nonetheless, uh, you're asking a lot to make somebody travel across the country uh, to, to respond to a lawsuit that you filed. The result is the law is relatively slow to respond to the question of how does the guy get to court? Now, those of you who have been to law school are familiar with the uh, International Shoe decision, uh, the Supreme Court case that, that s set up the, the parameters for, for using what's called long-arm jurisdiction, pulling in a defendant from some different state into your state so you can sue him. Um, when is that fair? You know? And therefore, early on, courts tended not really to care how the defendant got to court. Um, a, a famous case decided in 1886, Kerr versus Illinois, uh, the, the defendant was kidnapped from Peru uh, and uh, found himself in, first in, in Hawaii, then by tramp steamer to California, and then ultimately to that center of, 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 of due process, Cook County, Illinois. And that's the way the law was, up to and including a, a decision decided in 1952, a decision that's actually never been formally overturned. It's, it's effectively been uh, overruled by being ignored. But nonetheless, th th this, was the, this was the state of law until quite recently. But notice what the court was deciding. It was effectively saying, due process of law begins at the courthouse steps. How this guy got to the courthouse steps, we're not, gonna, we're not really going to much worry about. Now, it's interesting. There are still aspects to kind of the law of the jungle in bringing perps to justice. Many people think bail jumpers should be tracked down exclusively by agents of the state. I'm, I'm one of those, those people. But we still use private bail bondsmen as devotee, devotees of the TV show Dog the Bounty Hunter can attest. I'm a fan of Dog. Um, and if you watch the 
if you watch the program closely, and I do watch it closely, you'll, uh, you'll notice the dog and his lovely wife uh, tend to be a little slippery with, uh, with the rule of law. And, you know, I kind of enjoy that part of the program myself. Um, but, uh, you know, so we still have aspects of that that we're not so worried about how you get to our courthouse. We care a whole lot about what happens once you're inside the courthouse. Interpol um, is roughly 100 years old. It was created to bring the rule of law to gaining jurisdiction over foreigners. And, you know, and, and it's done, I think, a, a quite a good job. I've, I talked to a number of Interpol people this week um, preparing for this, and there was an acknowledgment that 19, sorry, 2014, 2016 was a bad patch, and this person, the two people I talked to claimed that the situation is, uh, has dramatically improved. But nonetheless, inevitably, an organization like Interpol will be misused by people uh, for whom it's an advantage to misuse an organization like this. I think there are a number of reasons, um, and I, Mr. Firestone, I think, was really good on, on, on pointing this out, a number of reasons why um, Interpol has been abused and misused, and, you know, sort of why now? And I think there are, are I, my list largely overlaps his. Um, I think part of it is there is an increasing recognition, I think, of the rule of law, that you know, the, the man on the street kind of has an instinct that stuff, some stuff is right and some stuff is wrong. Um, and um, and, and by, by misusing Interpol, I think malefactors are trying to launder their conduct. You know, you, 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 you can kidnap a person or red notice them. You know, which looks better? Uh, it looks a lot better if he's red noticed uh, because he looks good. You know, hey, I, I'm following the rule of law. What else could you want? You know, it's, um, any TV program would approve of my using the rule of law to further my interests. Um, you know, there's, it's, uh, there's almost in some, some places a kind of heroic quality to filing a lawsuit that... Uh, you're, you're, you're doing what you're expected to do. Um, second, I think, is the internet. Um, I think the internet looks, gives a patina of legitimacy to things that you're trying to do that really aren't very good things. Um, the internet also is a way of, of making lies appear to be truths. And so, you know, who cares whether this is true? It looks as though it were true. You know, I'm, follow, I'm, I'm doing all the things that, that truth tellers do, well, except for the fact that I'm not telling the truth. I think there's also a quality of uh, uh, that there's an attempt to, to undermine international institutions. That, that if all institutions are illegitimate, no institution is legitimate. So, ah, yeah, that's your opinion. You like that organization. I don't. To me, there, there, I, I, I cannot think of, of a plausible alternative to, to Interpol. I think the institution is needed. I can't think how, I mean, I think I can think of ways that it could be improved and the suggestions uh, that were mentioned uh, at the end of Mr. Firestone's uh, talk um, are, are, are great ideas. But I, I, it seems to me that there is no rational alternative other than an international organization um, uh, to, to legitimize the search for, for international criminals. 
But it seems to me that, that, you know, I know this is always the standard American solution to every problem, but creating greater protections inside the institution. You know, inspectors general, if God help us. Um, uh, when I was in government, I don't think I ever suggested bringing in an inspector general to do anything. But I have to say, I've sort of changed my tune on this subject. Um, one other way, it seems to me, is to require bonds to be posted by those who are posting red notices. You know, inevitab inevitably, some of these claims are going to be illegitimate, and there ought to be a way for people to be compensated. And so, you know, it's not unusual for courts to require uh, some sort of bond to be filed in order to, to participate in some sort of legal activity. You know, I've taken liberties with Louise's assignment, and I do that very rarely. Louise is not somebody you mess with. Uh, I, was, I was told that the first week I came to Mason. Um, so I want, to, I want to vindicate her belief in me. Uh, let me mention, there are, it seems to me, uh, serious national security concerns with, with a corrupted red notice system. And I'm using that, not, there are always going to be some mistakes, but I'm, I'm not using it in that way. I'm using corrupted in the sense that it is known and common for red notices to be misused by bad governments. And I think if that were to happen, I think that would be a serious national security issue. Um, partly, the rule of law is a national security issue. If international institutions cannot be trusted, and meaning people don't have a confidence in their legitimacy, in their honesty, and so forth, um, it will have harmful consequences to the safety of the nation. And people need institutions, and they need them to work honestly and fairly. Finally, if Interpol doesn't cure itself, it will be cured for it. Um, that is, uh, some countries may say, this system is so corrupt that we're not willing to put our name uh, with it, to have it associated with it. Um, or <clears throat> there will be splinter groups that decide that there's a much better way for, for this to be done. And that's why I think it's so important that, um, that, that, that the new leadership of Interpol takes this issue seriously and addresses it. Thank you. Thank you.